church. Oh, look at that. My notes are just taking off already. That's how awesome it's going to be. It's flying on at you. Are you ready? Are you ready? It's, it's Sunday 2 of 2019. We're going to come at 2019 like never, ever before. And so why don't you stay standing with me in every location? We're gonna stay standing. Why don't you get your Bibles out, your devices out, your phones, your iPads, your laptops, if you bring them to work. Maybe that's the online campus. Can we welcome our online campus today? We love you. We love you, Vive Roma, Ciao, Ciao Milano. We love you. I know, they're, they're meeting over there too. I'm going to learn Italian. And then, you know, we've got uh, San Jose. We love you, San Jose. We love you, Oakland and San Francisco. But Palo Alto, come on. Right, that's my church. I got my church back. Ephesians chapter 1. I didn't even tell you where to turn to. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. And the reason that I want you to stand as we read the Word is that You know, if you get in a routine, if you get in a rhythm, if something becomes really familiar, like coming to church every Sunday, you kind of know what to do. You come in and you sit in your seat, your special seat that doesn't have your name on it, but it has, you know, your imprint on it. And, you know, you come in and you get you get to this part of the service we've done worship or now there's word and now I can catch up on social media and I don't know what you do now you lean into the word right and so you get out your bibles and you know we are about to come around the word of god and the word of god isn't boring it's not dead the word of god is living it is alive it is breathing it is literally sharper than any two-edged sword able to pierce between bone and marrow soul and spirit the word of god that we are about to read today is going to get onto the inside of our life it's going to transform us from the inside out i literally believe that not one of us will leave any of our campuses the same today if we posture our heart for god to begin to speak to us and so Why don't you look with me here in Ephesians chapter 1 and I've entitled this message, Got This. Got This. Okay, you you have no idea what that means, but you look excited. Let's go on the journey together. But Paul is talking to the Ephesian church and he's saying to them in verse 15, he says, Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. He is a great pastor. I pray for you constantly asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope He has given to those He called His holy people who are His rich and glorious inheritance. Verse 19, He says, And I also pray, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the right in the place of honour at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. And now He is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things, not some things, not half the world's things, not just, you know, the things that we think that He can have control over. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made Him head over all things for the benefit of the church. He's talking about the supremacy of Christ here. We serve a supreme God. There is nobody like Him. There is nobody beside Him. There's nobody on His level. He is supreme. And then in verse 23, which is where we're going to camp today, which I'm so excited about, Vive Church. He says, And the church is His body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with Himself. The sufficiency of our Christ. 
He's so good. If there's any inadequacies, if there's any deficits that you've brought in here today, Christ is supreme and He is sufficient and He is able to move into our world. So we're gonna pray right now as a church together in all our locations. Father, I just thank You that Your house is full of Your Word and it is full of Your presence and it is full of Your revelation power and Your illumination power today. Father, I thank You that we would not be filled with head knowledge today, but that You would make us know some things in our heart today, that our spirits would be shifted today, that there would be a weight on us as we leave this place, a weighted anointing, I pray in Jesus' mighty Name. And everybody said? Amen, amen. amen. Well, why don't you nudge a person next to you and say, Jesus is better. Take your seat. You can take your seat now. Now you can put your feet up, but stay engaged. <laughs> My husband's heckling on the front row already. You behave yourself. Let me tell you, 2019 is here. Who's got this? Have you got this? Come on, some of you are telling me you've got this. We'll see. It's like, you know, week two into the year. And I love that saying, I got this, because there's two kinds of people that say this phrase. You've got the people who really believe they got this. Like America's Funniest Home Videos was created and made loads of money because of people like you who were like, I got this. And you throw yourself down and off buildings and things and do stupid stuff so that we can be entertained because you think you got this. And then then there's others of us who are just like, I got this. And it's almost like you're convincing yourself, I got this. Like you're looking at 2019, you're like, I got that. I've, I've got you, Jim. I've got you in the bag. I've got this marriage. I've got this parenting, you know. And so we talk ourselves into it. And I find that I've done that many times in my life. But one of the places that I have learnt that I don't have it the most has to be in the sphere of parenting. Like, come on, like any parents here, can you just help me out? Parents in all our locations, right? So you think you got this until you have children and then you realise you don't got nothing. You got nothing. And so I remember, you know, having um, Medea and she was, you know, such a blessing to us. She just was born smart and amazing and incredible and just, you know, way ahead of the game. And then we had the twins and the twins took after her. I was like, surely God would give me a chill baby. No chill babies. They were all go-getters. They all wanted to crawl and climb at like nine months of age, okay? So, you know, if your baby's not crawling yet, and they're nine months old, just thank Jesus, okay? Enjoy it for a little bit longer. And so I remember the twins, I had to somewhat gain control, okay? Again, as a parent. And so Adam and I decided we'd team up. We were like, okay, one day, we, this is enough. These twins are everywhere. They're climbing the walls of our house. We need to get them into line. And so we thought, I'm gonna buy, my cont contribution to the equation was a gate for the door. I was like, I'm gating these kids in. I know you think that I'm treating them like they're animals. They're, no, this is survival for a parent, okay? This is for their own safety. And so I got a gate for the door. I was so happy that I could just childproof their room. And then, you know, we had this two-storey, their window looked out and it, there was a two-storey drop down the window. And so they got to the point where they liked to sit on the windowsill and wave at all the cars going past. And then they would butt heads, you know, they were banging their heads on this glass window pane. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're gonna have to do something or these babies are gonna go out the window. So Adam, I went to my husband who fixes everything. You know, if you go to your husband, they like to fix things. Things. So, you know, they're fixers. Yeah, even when you don't want them to fix things, they like to fix things. And so I went to him and, and you know, he said, you know what, I got this. And so he gets, he comes back in with these wooden um, planks. Yeah, like just wooden planks. And he like zigzagged them up the door, like up the window, okay? And he's like, stands back. We looked like we were in the hood, like... <laughs> Like we're in a classy neighbourhood and he's just like made us, barricaded us in. And so now the twins, instead of banging their heads on the window, they're looking through this, you know, lovely, you know, uh, display. 
And so one day I'm like, okay, cool, we got it, we got this. Walk away, leave them. I'm not even kidding you, it would have been five minutes. And I have this lady frantically knocking on my front door. I'm like, hi, can I help you? Like wondering why she's so frantic. She's like, excuse me, I don't mean to bother you, but I just was driving past and I just saw two babies stuck in your front window. There's two babies in your front window. And I go running into the room to find that they have climbed up the wooden palings and lowered themselves down in between the window pane and the wooden palings. And they're like this, two babies in the window for everybody on the freeway to drive past and see. And my parenting, I got this, was on display. I do not got this. I'm, I'm surprised she didn't try and call Child Protective Services on me or something like that. But I was like, please have some grace on this mom of twins. But there is so many situations in life where you think you got this, but you don't got this. Like life will dish them up for you. You don't even have to have the enemy after you. It's not even like the devil's after me. He's not omnipresent. He's not after you. Maybe some of you aren't even doing anything good enough for him to be present and after you. But life happens, right? And so, my, sorry, sorry. Put the velvet back on. But, but, but life. You know, like you start a new job and you're like, I got this. And then, you know, you're one week in and you're like, I don't got this. You, you start a, a marriage and you're like, I got this. I, we agree on everything. It's going to be perfect. And you know, a couple months in, you're like, I don't even know you. Who are you? I don't got this. You know, you, you get into leadership and you're like, I got this. Because you think leadership's about you, but actually there's a whole lot of other people involved in the equation. You realise, I don't got this. And so, and so Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus from this perspective of, of experience that he's had. He's, he's using language. He's saying, I want to give you some in-depth teaching because this is theological stuff here, but I want to teach you from my own experience. I don't want you to just have head knowledge like I used to operate in under the law. I want you to have an experiential knowledge that I'm trying to impart into you. I've done some things in life. I've been some places. I've experienced some things and I want you to know he's talking not just about a head knowledge but a heart knowledge for these people he's like I want you to know sometimes you think you know but you don't know and so he's our example he's like you know what instead of using somebody else as an example I'm going to use myself as an example I used to think I knew I was a Pharisee I mean I was the best of the best of the best I thought I knew but I realized I didn't know and so I want to take a look today at this letter that he writes to the Ephesian church but I want to take a look back over some of the experiences that he had because he wasn't just giving them head knowledge he was giving them heart knowledge he'd actually walked with Jesus he actually met him. He transformed his life from the inside out. And this is what he's putting on the inside of him. And so when we meet Paul, he's actually Saul. Now God, this is so godly. He just gives people new names all the time. And you know, this is something that I do. I meet you and then I rename you. And unfortunately, you know, it's not a curse, it's a gift, okay? And so poor Donald, who's on the second row here in Palo Alto, for about five months was Ronald. Because he gave me his name in service while the worship was on. Don't introduce yourself to me in service. But, but just, you need to understand, he starts out as Saul, the persecutor of Christians. And then God renames him as Paul. And when he meets him, you see, Paul was so, Saul at the time was so zealous, he was persecuting the church. I mean, he got letters from the government, documents to make sure that he could persecute the church. And so on the way to Damascus to make sure that he, you know, he wanted to go and grab Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. But on the way, Jesus meets with him. And it says that he's walking there and a light from heaven falls down around him, blinds him, and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I think the interaction and the conversation that is taking place is so profound because he looks back and he says, is that you, Lord? 
And so this interaction, I think you should mark it because it's important that we understand what's taking place here. You see, he thought he was working for God, but in this moment, he's being arrested by God. And so he says, I want you to get up and I want you to go to the city and then do what I ask you to do. And it says that there's two men with him. Now they are freaked out. Like they're standing there and they can hear the voice, but they can't see anybody. And so um, Saul begins to get up to his feet and he begins to go to the city. But what he realises is that he cannot see anymore. And so independent, self-sufficient Paul has to be led by the hand by these two men to the city. There he is and he remains for three days. He doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, he does nothing but remain in this room. While he is in this room, he has a vision that God sends to him. He says, there's gonna be a man, a man named Ananias. He's gonna come, he's gonna lay hands on you. You're gonna see again. And so he begins to just wait there. Then the Bible drops us into the picture again of somebody else. And I love how the Bible does this. Because Ananias, it says that there was a believer in Damascus. Now there was probably many Christians, but I think it's funny it says a believer. Because not all of us maybe can believe that Christ can use us the way that He wants to use us. And so when He speaks to us, it's always in question. And so he says, a believer was there and he speaks to Ananias and he says, Ananias, I want you to go to Straight Street. I want you to go to the house of Judas. There you're going to find a man named Saul of Tarsus. And at that point, Ananias is like, wait, hold up, God. I know who this guy is. He is a bad dude. I'm not going to visit him. He has like actual documents to kill Christians. Are you sure you know what you're talking about? And God says, I want you to go. So he goes to him, he lays hands on Saul and his eyes and his sight is restored. And in that moment, he baptises him in the Holy Spirit. In fact, he embraces him as a brother. He uses the verbiage brother Saul. And it's such a powerful interaction that takes place. But Paul is like, I gotta let you know that I used to think I got this because I came from the paradigm and the teaching of law. And law will have you saying things like, you know, it's about my ability because that's what the law is. It's about your ability. It's about your perfection. It is about how good you can do something. It's about how you've got to have this. That's the language of it. In fact, it's almost like, God, don't worry, I've got this. And so Paul's like, I've been there. But in the face of that, Jesus Himself had to meet with me. I had to have an encounter with Him. He stands in front of me and He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? At this point, it's my personal revelation that actually I'm not working for Christ. Actually, everything I built my life on, performance, my ability, my self-sufficiency, actually gets broken down in that moment because if I don't have Jesus, I have nothing nothing. And so Jesus is so gracious enough to meet with him on the road to Damascus. And so you got to understand like, like he was good at what he was doing. Like he was a good Pharisee. Like he really believed that Christians were a threat to Judaism and they were. And so he's like at the top of his career and he's like, I got this. And Jesus is like, you ain't got nothing. And so He meets with Him. And I just wonder sometimes for us as the church, when we come in and we have our agendas and we have our things that we think we're operating in under the guise of I'm doing it for God. But we are the church. We are the body of Christ. And so when we start gossiping or when we start throwing shade or when we start placing question marks over other people's lives or when we we set ourselves up to say, oh, you know, I could do a better job than them, then we put ourselves in the same heart posture and the same spirit that Paul had when he met Jesus. In fact, Jesus has to confront us in 2019 and say, I want you to be the church, Vive Church. I want you to love one another. I want you to move towards one another. I don't want you to be separate. I don't want you to be divided. If you are attacking each other, you are coming against me because the church is made up of you and you are my body, you're my people. 
And so he kind of checks him. Why are you persecuting me? In fact, he looks at him and he's like, Paul, you think you're self-sufficient, but actually you're insufficient. Actually, I see straight through that smoke screen of self-sufficiency. You know those people who are like, I got it all together. They're the ones who don't have it the most all together. And Jesus is like, I see straight through that. I see, I call you on it. Then you've got Ananias and Ananias is at the other end of the spectrum. I mean, his name means the Lord's gracious gift. And he is a picture of the church today. He is a picture of what God is calling us to one another. He is the one that restores unity in the body of Christ. And he moves towards Paul in his unkindness and in his unlikeliness. And he moves towards him and he covers him with grace. And that is what I feel like God is challenging us to live up to today. He was challenging Ananias in that moment to live up to your name. Be the grace, Ananias. Run towards Paul. Don't hang back. Don't be it in theory, be it in motion. And so I feel like God is arresting us as the church today and He's challenging us and He's saying, I want you to live up to the name of the body of Christ. I want you to be the body of Christ that moves towards one another. Your job is to be on the platform and off the platform. Every word you speak matters. Our job is to bridge the gap, to bridge the divide, just like Jesus did for us. Our job is to forgive. Our job is to be unified. And so He's addressing the church on this matter. And see, He's asking for them to get their own revelation, but He's talking from a very real place. He went there Himself. And so revelation is understanding, right? Revelation is something that's revealed to you and you kind of have that aha moment. It's like, oh, I finally get it. Like, I understand what's taking place right now. And so Paul's praying that the Ephesian church would have an aha moment. I'm praying that Vive Church today would have an aha moment, that you would know the power of who you are and your piece to play in the body of Christ today. And so he says, I want you to know the fullness that we have in Christ. I want you to know that Christ fills all things everywhere with Himself. And he wants you to know that there would be an understanding that there is no deficit in Christ. And you see, when Paul gets converted, he actually begins to build the church. And so we looked at the transformation that took place there, but now we look at him in motion, him in the church. And when we see Paul in the church, we see that he has some insufficiency. And see, when you come into the church, when you get converted, when you get Jesus, you always get the church. It's never without. It's not like you have this isolated, oh, it's just Jesus and me relationship. You do, then you just got a head with no body. You need the body. There's completion in the church. And so Jesus, conversion, then He gets the body. And see, when you're in the body, you realise all your insufficiencies. Like, hello. Like, hello, I didn't feel like I was ungifted until I came into the house of God. And I'm like, what am I going to do here? Like, where's my place? Where do I fit? What could I possibly contribute and add? You know, there have been plenty of times where, you know, different seasons of life shift in the church and you have to assume a new position and you feel like, oh, I'm a little bit, you know, where do I fit? And God has to fit you in again. That's what takes place in the church. And so he's here and he's having this moment and he's talking to the Ephesians and he's saying, I don't want you to get stuck in insufficiency because I remember I was self-sufficient and then I went to insufficiency. I did the pendulum swing. I was out here and now I'm here, but insufficiency doesn't disqualify you either. Like you still can't get out of this building the church with insufficiency. Because he says, you don't got it, great, because I never had it either. And in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about his thorn in the flesh. And he says, the extraordinary level of the revelations I've received is no reason for anyone to exalt me. For this is why a thorn in my flesh was given to me, the adversary's messenger sent to harass me, keeping me from becoming arrogant. Three times, not once, not twice, but three times I pleaded with the Lord to relieve me of this. But He answered me, my grace 
My grace, underline that in your Bible, my grace is always more than enough for you and my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses, he says. When I'm weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So I'm not defeated in my weakness, but delighted. Like, Paul, you're a freak. Like, I don't know when you last delighted in your weaknesses. Like I don't delight in my weaknesses, but he's having a revelation moment here. And he's like, I actually delight in my weaknesses now. For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution, because of my love for Christ, I'm made yet stronger. For my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. I mean, your weakness attracts the power of God. And so he says, I used to think that this thorn was the thing that was preventing me from serving God. So I asked Him to take it away from me. In fact, God said, no, I'm not taking it away from you. I'm gonna leave it right where it is because that thing makes you dependent on me. And this is always not about your self-sufficiency, Paul. This was always about your dependency on me. You're not meant to be independent in Christ. You're meant to be dependent on Christ. And so he's like, I'm having this revelation because God just knew Paul. Like He knew His Son. Like you and I can run away with things, like like at the shops, right? I like to run away at the shops. Um, my husband will drop me off so that he can spend less time in the shops because I don't know who enjoys driving around the parking lot. And then he will park and take his time parking and then he will come and find me. And then when he finds me, I will lead him to the parking lot. And it's funny because he kind of hangs back a little bit, like, where are you going? Because I have no idea where he parked the car. I'm just leading him. And he's like, you're going to hang back and ask me where the car is? I'm like, oh, well, I figured you'd jump in and lead at some point. And so some of us have a tendency to just lead God. And God's like, I need you not here, self-dependent, self-sufficient. I don't need you here in the space of insufficient, like you can't be used. I'm gonna meet you in the middle. I'm gonna find you in this space and I'm gonna equip you with my strength and my grace is sufficient for you. He's saying you don't have to have the deficit as an excuse anymore. You know, why you can't serve me? You know, so many times we come into church and we're like, oh, you know, I'd serve you, God, if, you know, my finances were more in order, you know, then I'd tithe. Or I'd serve you when I've got more time because this is just not the season. Or if I had her husband, then I could serve you like she does. Or, you know, if I had him as my leader, then I could serve you. Or if I didn't have their children, those children, and I have their children, then I could serve you. And you can draw your own gaps in the blank there but you know oftentimes we'll see a season or we'll see a financial thing and we will cause it to be a limitation to how we serve Christ and I'm just here to say to you today at the beginning of 2019 what if the insufficiency in your life isn't there to expose how weak you are it's like God doesn't get enjoyment out of showing you how weak you are what if the insufficiency in our life is there to actually drive us towards the full expression of Christ's sufficiency at work through us. Actually, it's less about your weakness. It's less about your insufficiency and it is so much more about the sufficiency of Christ. He's like, get your eyes off your insufficiency. Get your eyes on my sufficiency. I have enough for you. I have more than enough for you. You don't need to look at yourself as defeated anymore. You can be delighted like Paul because to know that my sufficiency is enough for you. You see, God will get us to this point so we can have our own personal revelation that Jesus is better. That Jesus is better than me being better. That Jesus is better than my best plan. That Jesus is better than my best life. That Jesus is better than my best gifting and talent and motion. That Jesus is better. He's better than all my excuses. In fact, my insufficiency or my self-sufficiency can lead to my insufficiency, which leads to Christ's sufficiency. And in that event, it's done a really good work. 
I don't know what it is for you in 2019, but maybe your insufficiency in your relational status is what drives you back to Jesus. Maybe it's insufficiency in your financial world that keeps driving you back to Jesus. Maybe it's insufficiency in your, I don't know, maybe in your geographical status. Maybe you don't know why God called you to where you are, wherever it is in the world that you're watching from. And you can't make sense of it and you don't have any friends and you don't have any family and you just don't even know why. But it keeps driving you back to Jesus. Maybe there's an insufficiency in gifting and it keeps driving you back to Jesus. And I'm here to tell you today that Jesus is better, that you're right in the place where God wants you so that He can show you that Jesus is better. He is enough. Jesus is full. He is all sufficient. It's actually not about your gifting and your ability. It's always been about His ability to use us and co-labour with us. What a privilege that we, with all our hang-ups and weaknesses and junk, get to still be used by God. That He would channel the sacredness of His church through people like you and me. And so God's got this. You don't need to stress about building the church. Like some of you are so stressed out, like like me, like, oh my gosh, I'm building the church and we're going to like 10 campuses this year and Jesus, can we do this? And God's like, I got it. I've been building my kingdom long before you came along. I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not, shall not prevail against it. I'm advancing. My strength is enough. My gifting, my anointing, my Jesus is sufficient enough. We're at work building the church. It's not Jesus plus something. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's Jesus. And so we as the church, all our job is to just get more of Jesus. And if all those other situations and circumstances are driving us back to Jesus, then God's gonna leave them there because He needs us in that moment, in that space with Jesus. It's about Him. It's about a revelation of who He is in our world. Jesus is enough, let me tell you. And Paul, he says to them, I don't want you to just have revelation. And revelation always comes before illumination. Revelation was the voice of God saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's like, oh my gosh, I'm on the wrong team. And then he says, okay, now that you know which team you're on, I'm gonna let you run. I'm gonna illuminate your steps. I'm gonna bring illumination to your life. And so he begins to bring this illumination. See, because revelation's like, I got this. I know I don't got this. And illumination is God's got this. And so there's this sufficiency of Christ available for us. There's a sufficiency of Christ available for your Monday Vive Church. There's a sufficiency of Christ available for you in every single day. What will our life look like if we really get to know, not just in our head, but we know that we know that we know the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. Let me tell you, I can't walk into my 2019 timid. I can't walk into my 2019 afraid. I can't walk into my 2019 limping. It makes me wanna run. It makes me wanna run into my 2019 with the fullness of Christ backing me. There's nothing too great. There's nothing bigger. There's nothing that can raise itself up that Jesus Christ can't move out of my way because He is all sufficient. It's Jesus. And so Jesus is enough. Like when are we gonna get to the revelation that Jesus is enough? Like He's all that you need. You don't need extra finances. You got what you need right now. Sow it, use it, He'll expand it. The gifting you have right now, sow it, use it, He'll expand it. You just need Jesus. You just need Jesus. And so Jesus makes me have no excuses. I can't take excuses into 2019. 2019 is a no excuse year for Vive Church. If you call Vive Church your home, no more excuses. No more playing down your gifting. No more allowing deficit or limitation or lack to hold you back. You get to run into 2019. You behave differently because Jesus, Jesus came in. 
Jesus came into my world, He is my salvation that He is continually working out. I am complete in Him. I find my identity in Him. I don't find my identity in the world. I don't find my identity in situations or circumstances or possessions. I find my identity in Jesus Christ. He is where my significance is. He is where my security is. He's not in me becoming a YouTube famous star, any Vive youth. He's in Him, Jesus. I'm not saying some of you won't become YouTube famous stars, but Jesus is number one. Jesus is number one. He is better. He is better. Jesus is in second. He is better. He is better than anything else this world could offer. You can't win my heart with anything else. I am ruined for the house of God forever. This is all I want to build. Jesus. Jesus. His church. Everything we need is found in Him. If you need joy today, you can find it in Jesus. In fact, it's the only place you're gonna find it. If you need peace today, Vive Church, you have found yourself in a good place because the Prince of Peace, peace is a person. It's not in global peace or world peace or a situation or governmental spheres. It's in Jesus Christ, peace. If you need, I don't know, kindness, if you need goodness, He's the good shepherd. You find everything that you need, what you're looking for from your spouse, what you're looking for from your kids, what you're looking for from your coworker, what you're looking for from your pastors, you can find in Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is enough. And so Vive Church this year, we're gonna do something different because what Paul did is he stopped self-identifying. And we have self-identified because that's what the world tells us to do. But we don't need to self-identify because we find our identity in Christ. It is securely placed in Him. And so instead of self-identifying, Paul made the conversion and he goes, you know what, I don't find my strength in myself anymore. I'm gonna be baptised. I'm gonna publicly identify with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. And I feel like what God is putting on the core of us as a church is that we would identify with the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing. I have Jesus. Jesus is my secret. Jesus is the power that I have when people in the world see you going through stuff because stuff's still going to happen. They're going to see a peace in you and you can say, it's Jesus. It's all that I've got. I'm not better than you. I don't have a better gifting than you. I just got Jesus and He's enough and He's enough for you too. Jesus, if you're lost here today, Jesus is the one that finds you. If you're hurting here today, Jesus is the one that heals you. If you're having anxiety today, He is the Prince of Peace. He is the only answer that you have. If you are having confused thoughts today, He is the clarity that you need. If you are tripping up and you keep stumbling in your sin, let me tell you that Jesus is the one who can order your steps. He gives you a lamp unto your feet. He's talking about illumination. He's talking about revelation so that you can walk differently in 2019. If you have sin, He forgives you. He's already postured His heart towards you. There is no reason why we can't run into 2019 with any excuses today, Vive Church. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet in every location in every location. Right now, we make the great exchange, Father. We make the great exchange. Lord, we are saying we are going to not be self-sufficient any longer. We are gonna not make excuses for our insufficiency. We're gonna lean into Your sufficiency. And we thank You that You are incredible, that we find everything that we need in You. And so Father, I pray that You'd minister that right now. I pray that You'd minister Your peace. I pray that You'd minister Your joy. I pray that You'd minister Your power, Your vision, Your healing, Your promises. In the mighty Name of Jesus, for Your people. And everybody said Amen.